When you think of the greatest speedruns of gaming history, you might mistakenly point to Suiji's recent Mario 64 run. <laughs> or perhaps this gem from the dock. Why are we double jumping right there? No! No! Don't get me wrong, these are incredible. But after nearly 5,000 hours of Bannerlord, I think I might have them beat. I present to you the Bannerlord Solo Clan World Conquest speedrun. What the hell is even that? I know, I've got some explaining to do. Bannerlord is best described as many games wrapped up into one. A fast-paced first person medieval combat sim, an epic real-time strategy game where you lead hundreds of troops to war, a deep RPG with countless different skill builds, and a living, breathing economics simulation. The kind Spiff lovingly calls the perfectly balanced game with no exploits. And while there are many ways to speedrun Bannerlord, the crowning jewel has always been the world conquest. And because I'm a masochist, I decided to add extra rules to follow. But the most ridiculous? The solo clan rule. It's like trying to run a Gordon Ramsay restaurant by yourself. What are you? An idiot sandwich. Needless to say, this was not going to be easy. I started this challenge in sandbox mode because oh, hell no. I picked the weakest faction on the map, the Batanians. In nearly 100% of Bannerlord campaigns, Batania is wiped off the face of the map within the first five years or less. But this culture offers one amazing bonus that will be critical to success. Nope, not that one. Towns owned by Batanians gain a plus one militia production, making it much easier to defend towns at the low, low cost of... Oh my god! Bannerlord has an incredible character creation tool, and I've recreated several historical figures in the past, like these for a Soviet-themed campaign. But for this run, I decided to pray to RN Jesus and slap some war paint on at the end. And because this is a speed run, I tempted fate by picking a 50-year-old start, giving a massive boost to skills growth, but risking a premature death due to old age. For the banner, I went with something universally feared and hated, mathematics. Our clan motto, we will subtract your lands and divide your women's legs. Thanks to the magic of editing, this was only my second attempt at this challenge. And finally, we picked the manliest difficulty setting, Bannerlord with Death Enabled. Why? I ain't no fucking bitch, Chef. I don't give a fuck. What? And finally, our adventure begins. The only problem is the in-game map is awful for YouTube videos. Hold, please. Ah, that's much better. Let's take a look at the world and orient ourselves. We spawn here in Batania, the land of the shirtless savages and face-painted warriors. To the immediate west is Vlandia, modeled after the French Normans but are more like horse-riding cheat codes. Bonjour! Your cheese eaten surrender monkey! Also, everybody hates this man. Must be the mustache. In the frozen north, we have the Sturgeons, who can best be described as... And to the far east lie the steppe lands inhabited by the Kazates, who excel at horse archery and peaceful music. To the south are the deserts and dunes inhabited by the Asurai, highly mobile warriors who have mastered hit and run tactics. And finally, the once united empire that has fractured into three squabbling kingdoms. My first move was to head to the closest town, which happened to be the capital of Batania, Marinoth. I needed three things, a better bow, more arrows, and a better horse. Starting with 1,000 dinars and garbage gear isn't ideal, but luckily the vendors here are idiots. I pawned some of my clothing and weapons and bought all the hogs they had. Much like the con men advertising on YouTube, I took advantage of local drop shipping, cutting up the hogs and selling their meat and hides right back to them for a massive profit. With the proceeds, I was able to buy all my starting gear and put 1200 in the bank. Most campaigns start off by recruiting a small army, completing quests for villages, and competing in local tournaments. But that's way too slow for a speedrun of this caliber. Instead, I'll be massacring thousands of people in the first couple of weeks by myself, on horseback, making Papa Jengis proud, starting with these looters. Don't I needed a few that. more levels of bow to use the one I recently bought, and these loot pinatas are the perfect target. They love to follow in single file lines, take arrows to the face and once in a while hurl a rock back at you. After seven minutes of kiting them, I had decorated the fields with the final corpse. Not only did they provide the bow skill, but they also gave the most precious resource in the early game, Renown. Renown is used to level up your clan rank, which allows for a larger party size, unlocks becoming a mercenary or vassal, and even allows kingdom creation at the higher levels. But Renown is extremely slow to grind, and farming looters is like robbing poor people. You broke, motherfucker. If you're lucky, you can catch two to three groups per day, but sometimes it can take days just to find a single group. 
Instead, I decided to murder, loot, and pillage every village I could find. These are fixed on the map and always have a ton of peasants and militia to convert into renown, making the run much more predictable. But soloing large groups of militia and peasants is no walk in the park. They have shielded infantry, archers, and peasants who will hit you with rocks like a baseball pitcher. And so I had to come up with different tactics to deal with each enemy. The shielded troops were the easiest, as they can't catch you and drop their shield to attack when close enough. When dealing with archers, I used buildings, walls, debris, and anything else I could to obstruct their shots. Corners were particularly useful for playing headshot peekaboo. Shield troops can also be useful for blocking their buddy's aim, but leave just enough room to sneak in a headshot. And when I got bored, I played chicken with the leftover archers, trampling them to dust. For only two and a half minutes of work, I racked up five renown, nearly double what the looters gave. However, this was still too slow, so I headed south to villages with more people to slaughter. Herzogea was next with 41 militia. The most difficult part about fighting large groups is getting them to wrap around a building nicely. Getting sandwiched by spears and arrows isn't a pleasant experience, so running like a coward is a must from time to time. Once they're all running in the same direction, it's just a matter of shot placement and patience. This battle lasted only 5 minutes, but yielded nearly triple the renown. I headed south again, destroying two more villages along the way, racking up over 60 kills, and reaching my first objective, Clan Tier 1 and the ability to join a kingdom as a mercenary. While gaining renown quickly was important for increasing my army size, it does me no good if I can't afford to pay them. In raiding villages only earns 500 to 1000 dinars worth of loot each time. But by becoming a mercenary, I could continue my village raiding in the exact same way, but get paid by a king now to do it. 180 dinars per influence to be exact. Murder's my favorite. <laughs> With money printer mode enabled, I headed back south to the village of Dradios and liquidated 58 militia, earning nearly 20 renown and 16 influence. At a rate of 180 dinars per influence, I made over 2,800 for the murderin. And because I can hit six or more villages per day, it doesn't take long to farm up renown and a small fortune. Now the only enemy that stood in my way was myself getting bored. I toured the Western Empire's lands, raiding and pillaging every village along the way, and doing my best to stay focused, stopping at friendly towns to sell loot, and looking for companions to hire. These companions will lead armies for the clan in the future, so finding good ones was paramount. Sadly, Palisira didn't make the cut. Having only two intelligence and one focus point in Stuart means she was destined for the dumps. I stripped her of all her possessions, sold them for a small profit, and told her she was too old. Took her behind the barn and... You know we've got to do it. But life goes on. For most of us anyhow. I journeyed to the west coming across the biggest villages to date. Vinella even had over 100 people. I threw them into the meat grinder and laughed all the way to the bank. And by the seventh day, I had achieved what most campaigns take years to do, reached Clan Tier 3. Not only that, but I had saved up 45,000 dinars in the bank, and another 34,000 worth of influence waiting to convert over. Feeling good about being ahead of schedule, I raided my way back to Marinoth to sell some loot and continue the search for companions. And then, it happened. Surprise, motherfucker! In all my test runs, I was able to farm the Western Empire for months without issue, but this time, Vlandia screwed it all up. Raiding Vlandian villages is exponentially harder. Trees everywhere limiting your mobility, fast aiming crossbow militia instead of slow drawing bow militia, and enemy nobles with 100% cavalry in their party that are the medieval equivalent of Usain Bolt on steroids. But I was more than halfway to Clan Tier 4 and starting my own kingdom, so I put my nose to the grindstone and grinded. Empire villages were toppled in 5-10 to 10 minutes on average, but Vlandian villages required 20-40 to 40 minutes, and I couldn't take it anymore. I had been shooting arrows for nearly 10 hours straight at this point. On the bright side, my build was 90% complete. Bow and riding were capped out, and it was time to start working on the other important skills, like scouting and leadership. Given that I was balls deep in Vlandian territory, I committed an unspeakable sin. I hired Vlandian troops. 
It wasn't a proud moment, but this was a speed run, and I did what I had to do. Now, I could raid villages for troops instead of asking for trade goods, and quickly build up a small party. Not only would this speed up battles, but if I got caught by an enemy noble, I could sacrifice some Vlandians to get away, and feel great about it. Things were going smoothly, until I came to Varixand. It wasn't even a large battle, but relying on Vlandian troops is like betting on the French in World War II. I positioned my recruits behind a building and led my cavalry on a flanking maneuver. Except, they didn't follow and got stuck in a building. All I could do at this point was give the charge command and get in there myself. For some strange reason, Vlandian militia have the best shield in the game and can block everything thrown at them. Eventually, I whittled their numbers down to a handful, but I had less than 10 arrows in the quiver and no melee weapon for backup. Exactly 5 shots and 5 people left. 1 headshot. 2 headshot. Boom! Headshot! Boom! But they blocked one, and it came down to a one-on-one. -on -one. I scoured the floor for weapons, found nothing but rocks, and remounted my horse. Every shot counted here. I waited until the last second and... I finally nailed him, but barely did any damage. The rocks weren't going to cut it, so I dismounted to find a spear and bravely went forth. Both rocks missed, and it was time to tango. I blocked him and... Oh wow, he literally died from a push. How Vlandian of him. Enemy nobles were hot on my tail, so I made my way back to Batania to offload loot and recruit proper troops. My bank balance had shot through the roof in a short period of time, so fielding a large army was certainly possible now. I picked up Erban the Fatherless from the Tavern of Dunglanis. He will make an excellent party leader in the near future. But until then, I loaded him up with archery equipment and a horse, keeping him safely in the back of the army. It took less than a day to recruit over 100 troops troops and I was eager to return to raiding. The big difference now is that my group of recruits vastly outnumbers the militia, and I could safely auto-resolve battles, turning hours of grinding into a single click. But it wasn't that easy. It's never that easy with Vlandia. Nobles flocked to my fledgling party of recruits from across the kingdom, trying to annihilate us. What they didn't know is that this was all part of my plan. I used the auto-resolve battles to level up my medicine skill quickly, took prisoners and recruits to replace any losses, then intentionally got caught by the enemy. Each time I sacrificed friendly troops to avoid battle, I got a massive boost in tactics levels, something that will be key to this campaign very soon. I repeated this process over and over, raiding to get trash units, getting caught to sacrifice them, and stacking up the levels quickly. On one of my return trips to Batania to recruit back up to full strength, I came across this disgusting scene, a Vlandian noble violating a Batanian village. I quickly teamed up with a friend and smashed them to bits, taking their commander prisoner. As as much as I would love to execute these scumbags, execution wasn't allowed in this run, so I pawned them off to a local noble, turning them into cash and charm XP. At long last, it was time to graduate and deploy one of my favorite techniques, the Chris Hansen. To pull this off, I use a weakly defended fief as bait, something too irresistible for the enemy to ignore. They besiege the fief, thinking it'll be easy and fun. I sit outside and wait for them to start the assault, break in, and... Local probably should have brought more troops. Well, what did you expect to happen this time, Jeff? Because auto-resolve is completely broken when on defense during a siege, this unwinnable battle actually becomes a trivial affair, killing all 498 enemy troops at a cost of 113, earning 24 renown and another 40 influence. You boys just got Chris hansen and got turned into 30 more influence. And because the AI is terrible, I repeated the process several more times. I dominated the enemy in defensive sieges at a very low cost to my own party earning a ton of renown, influence, and skill XP. It wouldn't take long before I was ready for the final stage of the campaign, forming a kingdom. But before that, I needed to secure my succession in case I died from combat or father time. So I began courting this young girl named Ai Li. Don't worry Chris, I checked it out. She's 18 and fair game. I wooed her with my insightful talk of great leadership, roguery, and consolidation of power. Clearly things that 18 year old girls are interested in. But that was only the first stage. So I stalked her for 24 hours before she would be willing to discuss the marriage proposal again. Only this time, things weren't so easy. She liked my charm at first, but when I told her how little I was, she balked at the response. I explained that I was loyal, but it wasn't enough. 
She rejected me categorically. Livid from the rejection, I went on an absolute tear through Empire Lands, leaving a wake of death and destruction in my path that had not been seen up to that point. And because raiding for recruits produces more troops than are lost in each battle, it was 100% sustainable destruction. With that out of my system, I got back to work finding a wife. Renéon would be my next victim, falling prey to my 100% chat checks. I even spiked a double pass by telling her that should be enough. She agreed. Now all I had to do was track her father down and pay the dowry. He was besieging an empire castle, so I helped speed up the process. I sniped many off the walls, but it wasn't enough and we had to retreat. Talk about bonding with the father-in-law. Reinforcements came and we were able to breach the walls and storm the keep killing every last defender. Ergeon must have felt bad for me because I only had to pay three grand for his daughter. And just like that, I was no longer a bachelor. I did what every respectable husband would do in this situation. Got her pregnant and stole all of her clothes, but not in that order. With succession dealt with and nearly 300,000 dinars in the bank, it was time to accelerate my plans. Renéon was promoted to lead her own party, given troops, and called into an army. Not only would this increase our troop count, but also increase daily leadership XP gain by a significant amount. We'll be needing two perks from leadership to pull this campaign off. Leader of the Masses will give a plus five party size for each town owned and works for all parties in the clan. And Talent Magnet allows an extra clan party to be created, taking the total from four to five at the maximum. I had room for three parties in total, so I promoted Griff as well, taking the army size to nearly 300. Now I was on a seek and destroy mission, attacking any and all hostile parties I could find, save more renown and dinars. When the king wanted peace, I voted for war. Not only does war make for good profits, but it doesn't allow kingdoms time to recover, and I needed Batania as weak as possible. With clan tier 4 only a couple battles away, I also needed to focus on leveling scouting to 225. This will unlock the most overpowered perk combination in the game, scouting and riding 225. With both of these perks, prisoner escape chance drops to 0%, meaning enemy nobles can never escape once captured captured. It was finally time to become a proper landed noble and take my first fief. As luck would have it, Remtoil Castle had only 41 defenders by the time I arrived. And because I participated in the siege, I was at the top of the voting list and became the owner. Now there are a ton of building options here, but I'll be conquering so fast I simply won't have time to manage any of it. So I turned everything off and put the focus on training militia, which produces more free defenders. But becoming a landowner comes with serious consequences, like defending against a massive army. Luckily I had one more ace up my sleeve. Remember earlier in the campaign when I sacrificed troops to escape the Vlandian nobles? Now that investment is ready to pay dividends. The tactic skill is responsible for how much damage is done during an auto-resolve battle, but it only applies to the units under the party leader's control. However, I can take all the units from my clan parties and move them to my own, drastically going over the party limit. If I were to continue for more than a few seconds, I would get a huge group of units defecting the party as a penalty. But by doing it at the very last second before battle, I can avoid all penalties, but then apply all bonuses from my OP main character to everyone and annihilate the enemy. This impossible battle was a breeze, taking on 3 to 1 odds against a vastly superior quality army and pulling out a 15 to 1 KDR upset. Post battle, I simply give back the troops to my companions and move on. Sadly, Griff died in battle, so I had to replace him. Now the biggest challenge is trying to figure out what to do with all these idiots. I checked the kingdom ledger to see who I still needed to gain relations with and donated nobles to fiefs that they owned. Each battle was earning 60 to 70 thousand worth of loot to sell and my my balance was nearing half a million. With money in the bank and clan tier 4, I was able to start a fourth clan party and increase my army size to over 400. Finally, my power was beginning to be felt on the battlefield. Even with mostly recruits, I was able to topple massive enemy armies with ease. It was time to flex my might and take a town. As luck would have it, Epicrodia had recently rebelled, making it an easy target. I set up the siege camp, built trebuchet to knock down the walls, and waited a few weeks for the garrison to starve, leaving only the militia to defend. My men streamed into the breach, lustful for carnage, while I sniped archers from the rear. Only 10 men were lost. Basically, it's free real. 
real estate. And because I was the only participant in the siege, I was all but guaranteed to get the vote. Except that's not what happened. Even with spending the most influence possible, I was still outvoted two to one. These bastards will pay for this treachery. Now I was on a mission to ruin this kingdom any way that I could. I voted for a two front war and it passed. Usually it's the AI doing dumb shit like this. The nobles tried to placate me by giving me a dumpy empire castle. So I graciously accepted and then immediately gave it right back. Don't give me your sloppy seconds. I only helped Batania when it was beneficial to me, like besieging Lanakan castle, shooting defenders off the wall, and taking possession of my second castle. But the real fun was just around the corner. This Batanian army was desperately in need of reinforcements, but I was more interested in reducing their numbers instead. Because my army was close in proximity, they think I'm here to help, and jump in while heavily outnumbered. Vlandia was dangerously close to retreating to the safety of their castle, so I decided to actually jump in this time, and came face to face. Surprise, motherfucker! I then took immense joy in dismantling his army and selling him off like a cheap slave. The end of the year was quickly approaching, and the only thing I had left on my to-do list was to reach scouting 225. So I took a break from combat and followed large armies around the map, picking up their tracks and earning tons of scouting XP. I was so close, but I also wanted more land, so I helped take Ab Khmer back and outvoted the king to take possession. I now had three Batanian castles. I was only one level away from scouting when things got out of hand. My new castle was under attack, and two large Batanian armies were en route to help. Sadly, they were too late. The enemy scrambled to get inside to safety when a small party attacked, delaying them just enough for the main body to catch up. One of the two Vlandian armies went down, but one was still inside, waiting patiently. I wasn't strong enough to take them one-on-one, -on -one, so I let them march by and tried to take my land back. They immediately turned back to push me off, so I ran for the safety of my allies' large army and just barely made it. They were like rabid dogs trying to get me. But my allies' assault on Talaville Castle had begun, and soon his numbers wouldn't be enough to hold the enemy back. I had no option but to run. Luckily, this army was too small to contest me, and I snuck back around to take Ab Khmer back. I just needed the siege camp to finish and I could easily take my castle back, but I was too slow and I had to abandon the siege. Because I had just recently stopped the siege, I had a massive movement speed penalty making my escape impossible. Was this it? I sat silently for a few minutes, contemplating if I had just wasted 21 hours of my life getting here only to have it end like this. But then it hit me. I can't lose a battle that's impossible for the enemy to fight. I quickly disbanded my army, sent my resignation letter to Caladog the High King, and told him I was keeping my lands. By doing this, I was now at peace with Flandia and became an invalid target. I was free and clear, sort of. Because I kept my Batanian holdings, I pissed them off and they immediately declared war on me. And this was the pivotal moment in the campaign. I rushed to Lanakan Castle and started my very own kingdom. From here on out, there will be no peace until the world was mine. Whoops, I forgot to give my wife her clothes back. I had only 550 troops to defend my new kingdom with, but we would defend to the last. The enemy wasted no time in attacking, trying to take Lanakan back, but they were quickly rebuffed. A decisive victory at nearly 20 to 1 KDR. More importantly, I had four prisoners that would never see the light of day to lead troops against me. However, most kingdoms have 60 nobles or more, so this was only the beginning. They sent 750 necks, but lost badly. Then 250, another 570, but it was never enough. And soon they'll run out of nobles to lead troops, leaving their lands completely undefended. The only issue at this point was money. With less than 300,000 in the bank and a net loss of over 7,000 per day, it was less than ideal. To fix this, I besieged the closest town, Pen Canock. The enemy will surely come to relieve the siege soon or besiege one of my castles, so I skipped making siege engines and assaulted right away. I sent the shield wall up front to draw the attention of the enemy archers and spread my own archers behind them. The plan was to overwhelm them with sheer volume of arrows, and it seemed to be working well. The walls were teeming with so many defenders, some were pushed over the edge and fell to their certain demise. After 10 minutes, my archers had outshot the enemy nearly 2 to 1, but scaling the ladders was still a risky move at this point, so I ordered a retreat. My plan was to breach the walls if the enemy allowed for it, but they began trickling in and it was time for an all or nothing attack. I repeated the process again, allowing my archers to destroy the defenders on the wall. By the end, we were able to scale the walls without any resistance and clean them up from the inside. Pen Canock was mine. I immediately offloaded 55,000 dinars worth of loot and breathed a sigh of relief. 
Batania was reeling from their defeats, making desperate and futile attacks to claw back their lands. But losing another 800 troops put a massive dent in the kingdom. If you've played Bannerlord's late game before, you probably knew what was coming next. Asurai declared war, and the dogpile begins. After squashing several small parties, I made my way back to Marinoth. Taking this town would be a massive boost for my kingdom, and with a bit of luck, I was able to build trebuchet to knock down their walls. Even with the walls breached, it was a close battle, and more than half of my army was dead or wounded. The victory was short-lived, and Asurai showed up with 1,400 troops to take Marinoth, while Batania was besieging Penkanok. They had only 300 troops attacking, so I decided to fight the Asurai with money, paying them 5,000 per day for peace and saving Marinoth for now. I forced the Batanian army back against the mountains and pummeled them with arrows until they had no choice but to charge, which didn't end well for them. As expected, Vlandia joined the dogpile at the worst possible time, and I was now playing whack-a-mole with three different kingdoms. I specifically picked Batania to start because all fiefs are packed close together, making back and forth defenses possible. Now, the rules of the campaign state that nobles cannot be executed. However, mercenary scum aren't technically nobles, so off with their heads. Batania was finally on their last legs, barely managing armies of 200 or less, and without mercenaries their last source of manpower had dried up. But a weakening kingdom will attract outsiders like crows to roadkill, so I had to expand quickly, taking Sanon next, then Dunglanus, and finally Carbanseth. Except I had to stop the last siege and go on a really long detour of defending towns, destroying large armies, suing for peace when I couldn't get there in time, killing more armies, defending more, you get the idea, lots of whack-a-mole. After dozens of battles and draining half of the world's manpower, I finally returned to Carbanseth to finish the job. Nothing to see here. I dispatched more mercenaries and took a moment to admire my newly consolidated Batanian kingdom, the real Batanian kingdom. At this point in the campaign, I've been able to successfully defend against five kingdoms at once as a solo clan and take over my homelands. There's literally nothing the AI can do to stop me, although they can still be as annoying as possible and slow the speed run down. Let's take a look at the conquest path with breaks here and there to show only the interesting stuff. I was still missing a few castles in the north, so I took one from Batania and another from Vlandia. Land was changing hands all over the place in the southeast, including losing a castle to the Western Empire. Since I already had a lot of Vlandian nobles as prisoners, I decided to expand to the north, taking several castles and towns from them with pauses to defend the homelands, and take a castle from Sturgia. With six wars going on at once, I was both spreading myself thin and running out of room for prisoners. So I made peace with landless Batania, letting 51 nobles go. I continued my conquest in the north, but had to pause to fight this massive battle. Sturgia finally showed up with two large armies totaling over 2200 troops. I still managed to tend to one KDR and went back to stealing land. Going back to Vlandia, I swept through the north taking Ostakin and Turby Castle, but once again had to return home to fend off Sturgia. I actually lost Sanon, but chased them down and took the town back. After a week straight of fending off attacks, I went back to Vlandia and continued to clean up the middle section, taking two more towns and two castles. And again, I had to return home to take back lost lands and lock up nobles. Okay, I gotta pause the video here and just say, late game Bannerlord is awful. It's literally the same pattern over and over, and the only challenge is not wanting to gouge your own eyes out from boredom. Let's look at the conquest path and skip to the end to check the final timing of the campaign. I was able to finish off the rest of Landia in a little over a month, but had to pause for a week to defend. I then conquered to the south and blew through the Asurai lands without much issue until I came to the east. The Southern Empire had expanded deep into Asurai, and it took several weeks to defeat their large armies and capture their nobles. All of Asurai was soon under control, and I switched over to the south. Kazate was particularly weak, so I snaked my way back to the east and began to gobble up their lands through to the north. This stretch took months to get past, since three kingdoms were throwing everything they had at me, and it was back and forth for some time. Makeb was taken, lost, and recaptured seven times in less than a month. I put the eastern expansion on pause during this period and quickly traveled to the west. I had to put down some rebellions, and then I continued the conquest from there. Over the next several months, I cleared out the last of the three empire kingdoms. Now all that was left was Sturgia, but I had already captured most of their nobles from other wars, and I easily cleaned up their lands in less than two months. And so it was. I had conquered the entire world without exploits, cheese, noble executions, or vassals. I even dealt with peace deals costing upwards of 100,000 
1,000 dinars per day near the end, and didn't go broke. It was faster than any of my previous world conquests that had no restrictions. This certainly was the hardest challenge in gaming history for me. Let's be objective here though, nobody plays Bannerlord competitively, so being number one in a game with exactly one participant isn't exactly impressive. Kudos to the ladies and gents who actually compete in real speedrunning. Maybe this run doesn't stack up to them, but at least when I'm on my deathbed, I can tell my loved ones, I whooped Durthert's ass. Ass. <laughs>